everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that LSD can relieve end of life anxiety. Huh? After more than 40 years of no studies of LSD, the first clinical study of the therapeutic use of this stuff in humans was published in the peer reviewed journal, Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease. And this happened last March. And the results of the study showed that LSD, when used medically, can promote statistically significant reductions in anxiety for people who are facing the end of their lives. This was a double-blind, placebo-controlled study, and it was sponsored by the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS, looking at 12 people who are nearing the end of their lives. And today's guest is none other than Rick Doblin, PhD, who is the founder of MAPS. He's also the executive director. Since 1986, he's been working as a nonprofit group to look at what happens on the medical, legal, and cultural front when people use psychedelics and marijuana for non-recreational uses, like, like people who are using these to deal with deep trauma and things like that. And Rick's actually been someone I wanted to interview since the very first Bulletproof uh. Radio. And like a couple years ago, I sent a note out and I think we exchanged a couple things <laughs> yeah. and it just never came together, but it's coming together right now because I actually have him on the line. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm up on Vancouver Island. Rick, you're in Berkeley, I'm, I, if memory serves? No, I'm actually in Boston. You're in Boston. You live in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. This is okay. where I, I had to move to uh, convince my professors at the Kennedy School that I wasn't nuts. So they'd actually <laughs> give me a master's and a PhD. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I, it, it's an honor to meet you because you've done some pretty amazing work, and uh, I'm, I'm enjoying one of the, the world's oldest uh, smart drugs. This would be a shot of espresso. Oh, <laughs> but, great! I, uh, um, I, I'm really a, a fan of, of what you're doing because you're applying science to one of the areas that a lot of science is afraid to look. Yeah, and not, and when I say afraid to look, not just into politically incorrect substances. Um, as a biohacker, I, I firmly believe that it's my biology, it's my body, and if I want to put any molecule that I can manufacture or find into my body, it's no one else's business but mine. But so that's that's my yeah. personal take on this sort of thing. But if I'm going to put something in my body, I'd like to know what it does. And and what you've done for. 20 years now, yeah. more than 20 years, is you've looked not just at politically incorrect substances that mean you have to deal with government regulation, but you've also looked at death, which is kind of a scary thing in and of itself. And I want to understand, and I want our audience to understand, why are you doing this? Ah, well, let me um, show you this uh, stationery that I just picked up. Um, it was the first stationery from MAPS in 1986, and it's got a quote from Albert Einstein on the bottom. And the quote says, um, what shall be required if mankind is to survive is a whole new mode of thinking. And the sentence that went before that was, um, the splitting of the atom has changed everything except our mode of thinking, and hence we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. So my upbringing was, um, you know, I was born in 53. I was initially um, from a Jewish family and was educated about the Holocaust, and that was terrifying. Um, and then I was involved, you know, as a young boy at school with all these uh, exercises about the Cuban Missile Crisis and what to do if the nuclear arms race, you know, falls apart and we have nuclear explosions and we just go under our desk and we'll be fine. You know, but that was terrifying. <laughs> you know, I saw the lead-lined desk, you know. Yeah. And, and then, um, you know, I was um, the last year of the draft for Vietnam. So encountering, oops, all of these um, sort of life-threatening, terrifying kind of aspects of humanity, um, I also had the um, good fortune of, um, I feel like a, the multi-generational struggle. So my great-grandparents on one side, grandparents on the other were immigrants to the U.S. Uh, my dad was, they managed to survive, then they did well. My dad was a doctor and, and all. And then I had this um, ability to really focus on deeper issues other than um, food and shelter for survival. And so I, I was growing up in this way where I was just very much um, privileged in a way to have my food and shelter needs taken care of. And so I was sort of responding to 
the deeper threats, and including trying to figure out what to do about Vietnam, I started trying to understand how to respond to that. And I was, you know, growing up in the 60s and hearing the stuff about LSD and all, but I was basically um, believing the propaganda that one dose of LSD would make you somehow or other permanently crazy and that it would be destabilizing for the rest of your life. But I was looking at psychological mechanisms of what was going on in the world, and I felt like this dehumanization of the other, of the projection of one's uh, difficult parts onto the other, uh, the scapegoating, that th those are sort of core problems that could cause people to fear and then work against and kill other people. And so it, it started me thinking that this um, mystical experience of unity and what I think Albert Einstein was talking about in terms of the whole new mode of thinking, I think it, you know, it, it made me think that there's some way, if we can help people to experience their sense of connection with everybody, that that is a ground for more peaceful discussions, negotiations, things like that. And then when I first um, read One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey and was told that part of that was written while he was on LSD, which I couldn't believe, that made me question everything I taught was taught about LSD. And so I started experimenting it and, and with it and my first year in college. And when I did LSD, I started getting these feelings that there was something fundamentally healthy about it and healing instead of sort of inherently brain damaging. And I had these intimations of these feelings of connection and feelings of um, going beyond my ego. And so it felt like that experience would be something that had major political implications as well, both therapeutic and political. And I was um, having a hard time, though, with my LSD experiences and also uh, experiences with mescaline. Uh, you know, somebody came by a campus with uh, half a pound of mescaline. This is in the 70s, I'm guessing? Yeah, this is 71. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right before I was born. Yeah, Got it. yeah, yeah. So, you know, I bought a half pound of mescaline and my friends and I, um, you know, um, shared it. And, you know, so all these different things, I started getting this feeling that, that these psychedelics were incredible tools. And then I started realizing they'd been used for thousands of years. And then when I yeah. really woke up, though, in 71, 72, it was when the crackdown had happened and the massive backlash against the 60s. And these drugs were taken out of the research labs and people were heavily criminalized, life sentences sometimes for people for selling these things. And so I started feeling like, there's a, a unhealthy social reaction against them. And then because I decided to become a draft resistor for Vietnam, um, I started realizing that I was probably going to go to jail and that I wouldn't be able to have a normal career. And all of this sort of came together as an 18-year-old where I decided I want to become an underground psychedelic therapist. And, of course, I need my own psychedelic therapy. And then I'll work towards bringing these things back up from the underground. Now, you, you just said psychedelic therapy. Yeah. Now, probably 80% of people listening to this driving their cars right now <laughs> are going, what the heck is psychedelic therapy? And, and this guy is a little bit crazy. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know what it is, but talk about the history. Uh, I, I know you studied with uh, Stanislaus Grav. Yeah. And could you talk about what he did, the number of patients, what you learned from it, and, and just what is psychedelic therapy so the people who know what therapy is understand how psychedelics could possibly be related? Oh, okay. So um, let's go back a little bit further to where we hear about Freud and the whole idea of you know, psychoanalysis. And so what Freud talked about was the dreams were the royal road to the unconscious. And that in therapy, if you work on people's um, unconscious material, you can help them make a lot of progress. So it, I think that psychedelic, the word means mind manifesting. And that would encompass dreams. Dreams are psychedelic in the sense that your unconscious mind comes to the surface every night. And many of us uh, remember our dreams in the morning. We all have them at night. And that they can be a tool for our deeper feelings and urges and fears and anxieties and hopes and dreams. Um, so LSD, Stan Groff has said that LSD is for the study of the mind, what the microscope is for biology and the telescope is for astronomy. So LSD 
is a um, what he called also a non-specific amplifier of the unconscious. So when we talk about psychedelic psychotherapy, what we're really talking about is um, the the primary thing is the psychotherapy, and the there's a lot of non-drug psychotherapy before and after a psychedelic experience to prepare people for it and then to help them integrate it. But under the influence of a psychedelic drug, which would include MDMA as not a classic psychedelic, but still brings uh, manifests the mind, manifests things uh, that we've previously suppressed. So MDMA, LSD, even marijuana would be called psychedelic um, by this definition. And material comes to the surface, and then you can work with it and, and in different ways. So I think for people who have a hard time a little bit with understanding what psycho, psychedelic psychotherapy is, really just think back to the origins of Freud, and it's about working with your dreams. It's about material that comes to the surface that these drugs facilitate, but the drugs in themselves are not the treatment. It's the drug plus the psychedelic, and we actually call it MDMA or LSD-assisted psychotherapy. So that it's the human relationship that takes place between the therapist and the patient that is really the core, and the psychedelic just brings all sorts of material. And different psychedelics do different things. And I think what Stan Groff was a Czech psychiatrist, and in the 50s, he, he's 83 now. Uh, we're actually going to Israel next week because wow. he wants to uh, talk about the common mystical roots of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Oh, like like Mithraism? <laughs> um, and Baha'i. And, yeah, nice. so, so it's more the idea that mysticism is the antidote to fundamentalism. Uh, right. yeah, and, and mysticism came from those little mushrooms that were red with white dots on top, right? Yeah, for a lot of people, yeah. So it's got thousands and thousands of years. Even in the, the history of Western civilization, the, the Greeks had the longest-running mystery ceremony for 2,000 years, the Eleusinian Mysteries. And that was a potion that they drank called Kikion that mm -hmm. had a psychedelic component to it. And that was ended in 396 by the church, the, the Catholic Church. So, the, so Stan was basically a psychiatrist in the 50s, and Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company, which had developed LSD, Albert Hoffman, in 1938, he invented it in 43, uh, accidentally took it and figured out what it was. They sent it around to psychiatrists around the world to figure out what to do with it. And they thought it would be helpful in training psychiatrists to work with people that were psychotic or schizophrenic. They, they initially saw it in a way as a temporary uh, madness, um, but they later learned really that isn't what's a good way to describe it. But Stan ended up working with thousands of people with LSD and into the 50s, and then when the Russians uh, came into Czech, Czechoslovakia in 68, he escaped uh, to the United States and worked at Johns Hopkins. And actually, I wrote him a letter in uh, 1971, uh, actually 72, I wrote him a letter because um, I was so disturbed by my psychedelic experiences. I wasn't really capable emotionally of processing the material, of opening up, of surrendering to it, that I went to the guidance counselor at New College in Sarasota, Florida, and said, I'm having problems with my LSD trips. And it was a time of uh, America where you could say that to your guidance counselor and they wouldn't immediately kick you out of school. <laughs> it was great. A very different world than today. Uh, very different. And he ended up giving me a manuscript copy of Stan Groff's Realms of the Human Unconscious. Wow. It was incredible. And so when I read that, that's where it all came together for me because this was a report by Stan about the LSD research that he had done both in the Czech Republic and at Johns Hopkins, with heroin addicts, alcoholics, cancer patients, all sorts of people. And he felt that he was able to um, describe a new cartography of the mind, like he could map the unconscious. And that, that's what he meant by LSD is for the study of the mind, what the microscope and telescope are, that it brings things to the surface. And so when I read this book, I was just really thrilled because he was coming at it from a rigorous scientific perspective, but looking at religious, spiritual things, but he wasn't a philosopher. He was looking at it from a therapist point of view, like how do you actually help people get better? 
from suffering of, of any number of different kinds. And yet at the same time, he had this, you know, uh, discussion about mystical states of experience, how they were correlated with therapeutic benefits. And I felt here was, uh, my whole world sort of came together. And I felt this is it. This is what I want to do. It's really bring science into spirituality and therapy coupled with uh, psychedelics and that this would be a way in which um, to sort of move forward. Because I think many of us kind of associate with the 60s, the Beatles and, you know, make love, not war. And um, the Beatles were, were very much into psychedelics. And so was the Ken Kesey and the Grateful Dead. And, and so this and, whole idea... And Steve Jobs and, and, you know, Sting and, and many other greats magically somehow did a little bit of this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's like it's like when, um, with gay rights, you know, everybody um, knew somebody was gay. They just didn't know they knew somebody was gay because people were keeping it. If we could just have... Uh, you know, a, a day where everybody who had done psychedelics and it's influenced their lives uh, could speak about it, people would be shocked. Who had, who oh, the the range of people that have been influenced by psychedelics, and and so it, it felt like since they were so demonized and the 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 American system and President Nixon was so focused on stopping all the research and throwing all these people in jail that it, it felt like kind of a revolutionary. Uh, act to try to bring psychedelic therapy back. And it also felt personally that I needed it. And I, I felt like a, another way to say it is that we have, and what Albert Einstein was talking about, is that we have developed our technology, our rational mind, uh, to a miraculous extent. And we have incredible tools. But we've not sufficiently developed our emotional, spiritual capabilities so that we can handle the technologies that we have. So, so what did Stan do when LSD became illegal? Like he, he shifted his methods a little bit. Um, yeah. Can you talk about that a bit? I think listeners would love to hear about that. That's sort of the, the drug-free trip that, that also has healing experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there was this general sense that when uh, the Controlled Substances Act uh, was passed in 1970 and criminalized all these substances, um, most of the people that were involved with psychedelic research uh, went into looking at non-drug alternatives. How do you anchor this? And then we see the rise of the meditation and yoga and um, all sorts of um, biofeedback, all, all different ways to try to really anchor and ground these experiences. Yeah. And what Stan recognized is that the tool that's been used for thousands of years is breathing mm -hmm. and that you know from his experience as a psychi psychiatrist a lot of times when people come to the um, emergency room with a psychiatric condition um, they're hyperventilating and people are you know therapists and doctors are instructed to sort of uh, calm them down and so Stan recognized that if you could hyperventilate but not try to suppress what happens but try to bring to the surface what happens that that would be an alternative to psychedelics. And what he, what he used to say was that um, nobody could ever make breathing illegal. <laughs> but, but he was actually wrong, <laughs> because it turned out that in France, um, they have these laws against cults, and they decided <laughs> that the holotropic breathwork that he was developing, this hyperventilation, was a cult, and so they criminalized it. So wow, that, that's <laughs> only in France, I guess. Yeah, it was uh, shocking. So, so many people have gone to this holotropic breathwork and have felt that the experiences that they had were as deeper, deeper than the experiences that they had with psychedelics. I, that was my experience. I, I've done holotropic breathing three times, and two of those times were with Stan himself. And, you know, Stan's like, like the inventor of this stuff. And, and really it's an ancient, like Ayurvedic yogic technique that he adopted and he's added some music. And, and there's a whole set in setting, like you would have with psychedelics. But I've also tried ayahuasca with shamans, uh, mm. you know, shamans in South America and, you know, been in the jungle drinking stuff and throwing up and, you know, th the whole experience. I've had more healing from holotropic breath work than I have from using the few times I've used psychedelics, always in a healing, uh, therapeutic context. I, I think it's, it's 
It's、hmm. foolish and dangerous to take psychedelics and go to a party or go to or go to Disneyland. It, it might be fun, but there are there are things that can happen. Yeah, and, and I've witnessed people on holotropic breathing have deeper healing and awareness than people I've also seen on on other substances who suddenly realized, oh my god, I was molested for ten years and I didn't know. Yeah. Because our powers of self-deception are so high. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's shocking, but there are multiple gateways into the brain, and I'm paraphrasing here. And tell me if I'm wrong.、Mm -hmm. But my my perception of of your work with maps is that you're looking at ways to use these psychedelics as tools. Rather than as recreational substances, and these are as tools for personal development, for for healing trauma. It, it, I mean, am I、yeah. am I on the right vibe there? Because、yeah. we had a lot of, a lot of parents right now who are going, "Oh my God!" Like, you know, how how could Dave have this guy on Bulletproof Radio? <laughs> like, you know, he's pushing drugs. No, <laughs> like this is a, like an anti. Like, don't walk into these psychedelics because they are they're big, and you had problems with your own experiences, and you had to go、right. seek help for it. Yeah, yeah,、um, yeah. I think the the、um... The the main point here is that if you think about Maps as a nonprofit pharmaceutical company trying to develop psychedelics and marijuana into FDA approved prescription medicines, so we're trying to work within a very rigorous scientific context, trying to make these drugs available. As prescription medicines, but not as take-home medicines like the current antidepressants that we have, where you're supposed to take them every day and take them for the rest of your life and make the pharmaceutical companies a load of money. These are meant to be only given a few times, and they're given under supervision. And I think what you were describing before with the holotropic breath work is that it really is the feeling of safety and the feeling that you can. Be supported that people are know these states, and that if you are going to end, letting up new material, things that you've been scared of or suppressed in the past, if you feel safe and feel supported, then you can let things come to the surface. And the the kind of context that Stan creates in the holotropic breath work is very supportive, and that people where they've done LSD in recreational settings,、um, a lot of times they don't feel as safe. And they're trying to navigate, you know, in the physical world. So part of their mind has to be, you know, making sure that they find their way home, or they don't run into traffic, or, or even different ways. So that there's、um, a lot of individual support. And the other thing with the breath work is that you can start and stop it on your own. It's not like when you take a drug, you're in for the ride. And there's advantages and disadvantages to that. The other thing that Stan did that I thought was elegant and beautiful about the breath work is that there are all these breathing techniques that are very sophisticated that have been developed for thousands of years about breathe in this nostril a certain number、yeah. of times and breathe out that nostril. And so what Stan has done is he's boiled it down and he's basically said breathe faster and deeper. <laughs> exactly. That's it, and But, find your own way. So it's not there, it's not cluttered with a lot of dogma. There's a warning though that that would go with that.、Um, I don't recommend people practice holotropic breathing by themselves、uh, until you know what you're doing, and even then, having. Someone, usually a therapist, someone who's trained in this with you, at a minimum, is is a really good idea. And and one of the things that that helps when you're doing something like this, whether it's psychedelics or whether it's breathing, that also induces these profound self awareness altered states. It, it's that you're laying there and you want to be able to leave your body, like I've done during holotropic breathing, and and it's kind of a scary experience. But knowing that a friend or a, someone you trust is there to like take care of your physical needs. It, It makes it easier for you to like push the, you know, what you're hiding from yourself or whatever it is you're working on,、um, and just kind of doing it yourself in in your dorm room. It, it, it's gonna、mm. just be a very different experience, and you might not like the results. Yeah, well, just for、uh, an example. So as I said,、um, you know, Stan is in some ways very idealistic. So we're heading off to Israel next week, and we're gonna have a holotropic breath work workshop, a two day workshop, as well as lectures in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And the way that they're structured is that people divide up into pairs,、yeah. and so everybody who's breathing has a sitter who is there with him just to、uh, protect his space, to remind him when he stops breathing, he or she stops breathing. And then, in addition to having somebody there sitting with you, 
you know, observing how you're doing and sort of helping you, there's trained facilitators. And so we're having one trained facilitator for every 10 people that are breathing to rotate around. And then in addition, there's Stan. So that this is a very heavily supervised and supported context. And it's surprising, but just through hyperventilation, you could end up triggering <laughs> incredible experiences that you would never have predicted ahead of time would come up. It's, it's amazingly powerful technique. So, so it, 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 this shares a lot in common with... Uh, with what happens when you have a therapeutic use of these different things, uh, these different substances that, that uh, in my experience of them in, in healing context, they, they sort of get in the way of all the stuff you think about all the time. So you stop thinking about it a while. And then when you go in and you look at what's left, like that's where you can do amazing things for your ability to to change yourself. Um, even something as simple as a, as a float tank. I, I mentioned before we started recording. Yeah the new human hacking facility here on Vancouver Island, I put a commercial grade float tank in there for that exact reason. And, and I think you have some experience with floating as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Well, at the same time that I was 1972, that I was uh, doing LSD and reading Stan Grop, I was also reading John Lilly and John Lilly was the inventor of the flotation tank. And he had written this book, uh, programming and metaprogramming in the human biocomputer. And that book was about research that he'd done in the 50s and 60s that was funded by the U.S. Navy, where he developed this flotation tank. Partially, they were thinking about what happens when people go into space. And they tried to eliminate all the sensory input. And he would, eventually, he started doing LSD inside the tank and started trying to think about the brain as a computer and which parts of his brain and experiences were being nice. catalyzed. So, some elements of biohacking in that thinking, <laughs> for sure, hacking the human body, cool. Yeah, so friends and I, you know, experimented with our own isolation environments and eventually built our own flotation tank, and then I had a tank at my house that I uh, had for years, and I've done LSD in the tank and marijuana in the tank and nothing in the tank, and I've spent a lot of time floating in the tank. and. Um, at the same time, I, I found it tremendously helpful, absolutely very helpful, because, um, you know, initially, the flotation tank, for me, it looks like a coffin, like, totally. like you're getting into this coffin, and then when you're in it, there's only like 10 inches of water, so heavily uh, salt water, so you can float, you can completely relax, and you could even fall asleep in it, and the water is... Um, sort of above your ears, but below your eyes, nose, and mouth. And you can relax your neck's muscles, which is amazing, you know, to, to realize how much tension we're constantly keeping in our neck. But you're able to actually relax so much that it changes from like a coffin to infinity. You're just floating, yeah. you know, because you don't touch anything, you don't feel anything. Uh, the temperature of the water is similar to the temperature of your body and the air. Um, it, it's just remarkable of a of an environment, and and then you get comfortable with yourself, and with your thought process. It's very deeply relaxing, and so I was um, experimenting both. But I, I do think there's um, looking back on my life, there's kind of a cautionary tale <laughs> about John Lilly and the difference between John Lilly and Stan Groff. So that I think Stan was focused on healing. That was the primary thing he was using. Alter, non ordinary states of consciousness, using LSD, using uh, holotropic breath work. But his, his mission, in a sense, was healing. Whereas John Lilly had this more um, intellectual focus on understanding. And I think he also, once the crackdown came, whereas Stan was able to move from working with LSD to developing holotropic breath work, John Lilly. <coughs> I think felt like this is, you know, stupid people, stupid world, they're, you know, backlash. And he kind of got uh, arrogance about him. And he ended up getting very involved with ketamine. And ketamine is a psychedelic, well, it's a, called a dissociative anesthetic. And in lower doses, it's like a psychedelic, and you can remember it. Um, and, and he kind of, I think, escaped into this, um, what seemed to him like a more spiritual higher plane, but was actually escape. And he ended up, so I had sort of these two heroes, you could say, Stan and John Lilly, and LSD and the flotation tank. And then I really learned a lot from both of them. But 
I felt like um, with John Lilly that it was really tragic how his life ended and how he became more, um, you know, running away. And, and I, I do attribute that in part to this um, arrogance that he had and, and impatience and, and a, a terrible disappointment when these incredible tools, when the backlash squashes them all, um, I, it's just brilliant that Stan was able to go forward with the holotropic breathwork. Uh, I, I think he, he brought something of great value to me. Uh, there are times in my life when I probably didn't realize that the world was as, as uh, emotional and spiritual as, as it is, uh -huh. uh, because I didn't really like that. But when I did holotropic breathing, I'm like, oh, <laughs> maybe I hadn't noticed that before, but it, it can cause some profound shifts in, in your perception. Yeah. Well, um, what didn't you like about it? You know, I I grew up in a very science based uh, family. You know, it, the, we re, you read the Skeptic Inquirer, and, yeah, and you yeah. sort of look at everything as as a truth table. I studied computer science, uh, so the world should be logical. And my perception now is that I have a logical part of my brain, and I have a hugely irrational part of my meat operating system, my body, uh, and that the irrational and the rational both exist inside my consciousness at the same time, depending on what level I'm at, and that yeah. neither one is superior to the other. But by having awareness of both, uh, I'm actually happier, and I perform better, and I can help other people more. But it was that awareness that I had to at least acknowledge the existence of the irrational. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that might be important. Uh, and then the value of it. So that was just, you know, my own ego. But um, holotropic breathing did paint a very different picture of reality for me um, than what I thought was real. So um, wow. having that sort of awakening experience, whether it comes through a therapeutic use of these things, whether it comes from a drumming ceremony with a shaman in South America, where you're you know drinking uh, from a, you know, the twisted vine, oh, all yeah. of those experiences, they can lead to some sort of thing. I need to pay attention to that. And when I do pay attention to that, my abilities in this world are different than they were before. And, and that's um, that's a great gift. And however yeah. it comes to you, it, it's it's you know, it's a powerful awareness, but it comes with responsibility. And and that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about, like uh, that right. you know, much of the history of the evolution of consciousness is intertwined with our our plant yeah. uh, entheogens. But um, what do you say to people who say, okay, you know, John Lilly was funded by the Navy. You know, right. did the CIA dose Russian operatives with LSD? Like, like, isn't there a bit of a, uh, uh, you know, these things can bring up things, but don't they have a dark side as well? Well, definitely. And in fact, I think the best way to think about these things is they're tools. And some people yes. want to make them into entheogen. So the new word for psychedelic is entheogen, you know, yeah. to bring out the God within. So I never use that word. I don't like that word at all. I think it's too positive, the same way the word hallucinogen yeah. is too negative, like it's a delusion and it's not real. So, you know, the surgeon's knife can save your life and the same knife can kill you. So it's, it's why we say it's MDMA assisted psychotherapy. These drugs are dominated by therapy or by culture. Um, they're not automatically illuminating the truth. That if you look at the ayahuasca churches that you're talking about that work down in Brazil, they're homophobic, they're hierarchical, they're patriarchal. They're yeah. trapped in their own cultural sense. And so we're all struggling to kind of get out of our own subjectivity and you know, out of our own cultural programming and these tools can be helpful for that but they're just tools and i think what we have the big problem of prohibition is that we've made drugs they're good drugs or bad drugs and the, we've yeah. invested properties in the drugs whereas it's really about the relationship that we make with the drug and i think by criminalizing certain things we don't focus on the relationship and so lsd is either you know, the demon drug or the tool to, you know, mystical awareness. Whereas it's really about how it's used, how you prepare for it. And then even more importantly, what do you do with the experience once you've had it? So when we go back to talk about psychedelic psychotherapy, just to give you an example, our, our approach with MDMA, and we're working with veterans, so that's another yeah. connection with the military, is that we have a three and a half month treatment program. And during those three and a half months, people get MDMA only three times and once a month. And they have weekly non-drug psychotherapy before, for about three weeks before they have the first MDMA ex 
experience. We have our experiences during the day. They start at 10 in the morning. They go till around 6 at night. People stay in the treatment facility. They stay overnight. And then they have hours of non-drug integrative psychotherapy the next day. Then they go home. And we call them every day on the phone for a week for 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just to help them do the processing and the integration. Then they come back for once a week for about three to four weeks for non-drug psychotherapy. Then they have the second session. And then that repeats again for their third session. And then there's weeks and weeks of integration afterwards. So this is essentially a psychotherapeutic process that's punctuated occasionally by these powerful experiences with MDMA or with LSD or psilocybin that bring experiences, bring things to the surface. And what you do with them is really the key. And I think that's a major distinction between recreational use, where people are going for the experience itself, and they're looking for having just a narrow slice of the experience. They only want to have a great experience. They only want to be happy. And with therapy, we're looking at not so much what happens, although it's crucial what happens, but we're looking at what people bring back and how we can anchor and ground it so that there is therapeutic change. And so we've talked to people that have taken MDMA ecstasy at a rave, at a party, women, and they've said, you know, while I was there, I remembered having uh, been raped, or I remembered sexual abuse, and I was with a bunch of friends, and they only wanted to party, and so I felt like I had to stuff my feelings down, and then I ended up feeling worse off and disturbed for months afterwards. I, I can tell you fully three-quarters of the times that I've used um, hallucinogens in, in a group with with intent for healing, not a party group, but oftentimes it's it, quasi recreation like everyone there is is there f f not not to have a good time and dance under bright lights but you know we're, we're sitting in a quiet place and doing things just about every single time at least one person has an awareness like that yeah. and if there isn't a group of aware people to support them it is tr it's, it's really traumatic as all hell yeah um, yeah and being able to sit there and walk someone through uh, realizing that that the the story of their life the way they played it isn't actually what happened right it, it's seriously ungrounding but it's also healing and it allows them to change their behavior in a very meaningful way. But if you don't have the right friends there and they're not there to listen and you don't feel safe talking to them, um, really don't, especially if you've never had any of this stuff, don't go try it at a party. <laughs> like it's just yeah. a bad idea. Yeah. And even the idea that you're going to take this drug for only one sort of slice. If your intention yeah. is, I'm only going to take this for fun. You're, you're setting yourself up for a problem because a lot of times when difficult stuff comes up, if you attend to it and work through it, it's like um, grief. You know, if you let out the tears, a lot of times you'll feel better. It doesn't even take that much time, but it takes courage and a willingness to do it. And if you're defending against it, what we found actually with LSD and with other drugs is that the more open you are to it, the shorter the experience, the more it goes through you. And the more resistance there is to what's emerging, the longer it takes. And so I think that if people have this narrow sense, this is a fun drug and I'm only going to take it for fun, and then something difficult happens, they could really end up a lot worse off. And so one of the things that we're doing is what we call our Zendo project, and it's harm reduction, psychedelic harm reduction. And we do yeah. this at festivals all over the world, at uh, Burning Man and Boom Festival in Portugal. And we're sending I, I've, a... I've seen you guys at Burning Man, and I, I saw yeah. the people you were helping, so um, that's valuable work. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're just sending a whole team down to Costa Rica uh, for Envision Festival. So basically the idea is a lot of people at these festivals will use these drugs for fun, and then something deeper happens, and they're not prepared for it. And the normal response is that they get taken to a medical staff, they get either tranquilized or if they're really disruptive, they get arrested, and then it becomes a long-term problem. But if we can offer supportive care by people who are trained and know that suppressing is not the thing, letting it out is the approach, then people can benefit from these experiences and then go back even to the party if they want. But that we're trying to create a model for a post-prohibition world and we're also trying to just educate people about how there's more depth to these experiences than people might be uh, anticipating or preparing for, and that a lot of people will get in trouble. So, in a sense, prohibition is a terrible counterproductive idea, but legalization doesn't eliminate all the problems anyway, either. And so that's where this idea of 
providing supportive care for people and getting across. And it's different in the United States. The, um, at the RAVE Act has criminalized harm reduction. And it's made it so that it's a sign that you know drugs are being used. If you're a promoter, you could go to jail and you can have your assets seized if the police want to come after you for harm reduction efforts. But it's perverse. But in uh, Europe, it's different. Yeah. So at Boom Festival, they do on-site drug testing. They end up um, telling people what they are getting so everybody knows what dealers are on notice. <laughs> you mean you, you can have your, your drugs tested before you take them? Yeah. That's what on-site drug testing is? Yeah. I love it. Well, not, That's so different than the US. Uh, oh my God. It's thin layer chromatography. It's not just like, you know, a little wow. chemical pill, you know, uh, liquids to see the reaction. They tell you exactly what's in it. Not only what you think is in it, but what everything else is in it. Wow. It, it's incredible. I mean, one time we were there actually and somebody um, collapsed on the dance floor and it was shortly after he'd taken something and we were able to find out that what that was it was LSD and that he didn't wasn't poisoned and that we just needed to sit with him and eventually he came around and he was okay but it was psychological but having that ability to know what people take I mean one of the biggest problems of prohibition is that uh, drugs are adulterated and people don't know what they're taking. And there, there is this human urge to uh, change your state of consciousness, to try to reach these other more profound emotional states. I mean, you, you talked about how you're irrational and logical both, but a lot of us feel like we're trapped in the logical part and we're mm -hmm. disconnected from our feelings and we're scared of them. And once they come to the surface, they're going to take over in a way. And that's like keeping, um, you know, a dog, you know, chained and wrapped out, you know, in a cage in your basement. When it comes out, it's kind of wild. But if a dog is treated with love and, you know, eventually you can make friends with the irrational parts of your brain and the emotional parts of ourself. So I think bringing to the surface these irrational energies is the healing aspect to it, even though they're really powerful. I, I'm amused that you chose dog as the analogy in, in the Bulletproof Diet book. Oh. I just hit the New York Times bestselling list. Um, I talk about you know, the three Labrador brain behaviors you have, and oh. these are the irrational parts of, of the body. But one of the things you can do is you can train the dog if you can see it. Yeah. And then suddenly the rational parts get easier and the irrational parts make more sense. Um, yeah. But uh, it, it's just funny that, that yeah. you chose that analogy because it's, it's one that works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, as part of my early time when I was experimenting with LSD and also with the flotation tank, um, I raised a, a full bred Alaskan timber wolf. Oh, wow. Yeah. For, that is some serious heavy duty training. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For two years. And the, the amazing part of it was that um, wolves are born with their eyes closed for the first few days. And so I was in Sarasota, Florida at New College, and that's the home, the winter home of the Ringling Brothers Circus. And also carnivals are there, and uh, there's people that breed wild animals for carnivals. And this one person was uh, breeding wolves and uh, lions and tigers and stuff and wasn't taking care of them. And the Humane Society shut them down, and the female wolf was pregnant and had a litter of eight. And the zoos were full, the sanctuaries were full, there natural habitats were under attack and so they just put an ad in the paper like wolf cubs for sale and <laughs> you had to be um you know interviewed by the humane society and then you had to build the six foot high fence and but the the point was that these wolves were taken away from their mother when they were born and bottle fed and so when they opened their eyes they bonded on people and so i got this wolf at eight weeks and, and lived with him till he was two years old and then eventually found a sanctuary that opened up that had a female wolf that needed a mate. So wow. I, I had him, I howled with him, I could run. I, I built my house in Florida at the edge of town and there was hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of acres of empty land and I could run with him off the leash through the woods. Wow. And, and it was just fantastic. But this was people's in, image of a wolf is, you know, this ravenous uh, Little Red Riding Hood killing kind of, you know, grandmother killing, uh, you know, merciless hunter. And actually, they're tremendous um, family animals. They babysit for each other's cubs. They're very social. They're, they're, they don't attack humans. 
and I learned a lot from this wolf. And um, I mean, just to say, one of the things that, that persists to me to this day is that when I would walk, well, walk with him through the woods and run with him through the woods, he had so much energy that he would just like run through things or over things. And so I got this idea, the straight ahead thing. And if there's an obstacle, it's just an opportunity for exercise rather than like, <laughs> let's go, you know, the easy way around. So if, if you notice, and I think everybody who's listening, if you can imagine wherever you live, there's sidewalks, there's all sorts of ways where we're channeled to go certain ways. And that's not always the direct way. And so I find myself, whenever I walk across a lawn or step off the path trying to go the direct way, that's my wolf. That's what I've learned from the wolf. And it's, wow. it's like the same for mental things. We're, we're so channeled into habits and patterns that we don't notice a lot of the world going by. But what was your wolf's name? Phaedrus. Um, Why did you name him that? Well, there was a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. <laughs> did you read that book? Yeah, That's it's a, a famous book. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just actually, I've got this uh, young woman who's, um, let's see, 23 that works for MAPS. And I was just talking to her today about this, and I asked her if she knew the book, and she'd never heard of the book. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, um, and uh, hopefully she'll read it. But it's a fantastic book. And, and so Phaedrus is really a character in the Plato dialogues. And it's a character who's from the country. And the dialogue with Phaedrus is about the taming power of love. And I thought that that would be a really appropriate name for this wolf, because the same way with our unconscious and with, um, you know, these urges, you know, and uh, the irrational, that if we can approach them with love and acceptance, uh, they can be uh, tamed. They can become our friends rather than our enemies. Wow, that is, that's amazing. I, what a, what yeah. a fitting name. Yeah. Uh, do you have enough time to go for about another 40 minutes? Yeah, if so, yeah, we can sure. Do a, Sure. Okay, let, let's yeah. do that, and we'll, we'll end up doing a double episode. So if you're oh. listening to this, this is one of those cool things. I'm going to end up like flaking on a couple other people <laughs> on the Swiss call, but this is way more fun and more interesting. So, so this is the end of, of the first half of the interview, which is awesome with, with Rick Doblin from MAPS. And what, we're, what we've just talked about here is some of the reasons you might consider legalizing and using psychedelics under settings for healing, not just all willy-nilly here. And what we're going to talk about is specific psychedelics and what they do and why you might want to use them. So the first one is maybe a little bit more legal, spiritual, like like what, why? What's the reason behind this? And our second conversation will be us talking about the specifics and the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, this is an amazing opportunity to talk with a guy who spent many, many years doing yeah. things like <laughs> training wolves, which is awesome. <laughs> Well, he trained me a lot of ways, too. There you go. Fair <laughs> enough. So, Rick, would you share where people can find information about your work, uh, URLs and things like that? Yeah. Um, people could go to maps.org, M-A-P-S, like Maps of the World, maps.org. And the website has got an enormous amount of information, and they could learn about all that we're doing with all the different drugs and also about our uh, harm reduction, our psychedelic harm reduction projects. If we're, we're a nonprofit organization and we exist entirely based on donations, so if people wanted to make a donation, that would be particularly appreciated. Tax deductible donation and um, MAPS Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. It actually came, the name came from a book by Ralph Metzner. And Ralph was one of the people with Ram Dass and Tim Leary at Harvard that was sort of part of the original uh, group at Harvard that brought in uh, psilocybin and LSD. And the book was uh, Maps of Consciousness. And so when I was trying to start a nonprofit, um, I was trying to, I knew I wanted the word psychedelic in it. And then when I, I was looking at my bookshelf and there was this maps, and I thought, okay, it's got a P in it. I can work with that. So maps.org. Okay, maps.org. Now, uh, and Stan Groff's work, uh, it, he's written you know, the Holotropic Universe, many, many things, and we've talked about that a lot. I'll put links to his, his stuff in here into the show notes, and when you come to the yeah. website, you'll be able to see that. Now, there is a cool fact of the day at the beginning of every show, and I just asked Rick for <laughs> a cool fact of the day, so I didn't have to make one up because I didn't know we were going to do a, a double, double header here. <laughs> so, Rick, go ahead. Tell us your cool fact of the day. 
Well, the LSD study that we recently completed in Switzerland, the first LSD study in 40 years, the cool fact is that of the 12 subjects who are in that study, 11 of them had never done LSD before. It's not a bunch of aging hippies that are facing life-threatening illnesses and now they are turning to things that they did when they were young. We're trying to mainstream psychedelics. And in that study, we were able to reach out to a new generation of people and get 11 of the 12 people who'd never done LSD before to volunteer for the most highly demonized and feared of all the psychedelics. Uh, that is uh, that is an amazing piece of info that that people are more afraid of death than they are of hallucinogens. Yeah, it, it makes sense. Yeah. Well, well, that was part of the political. OK, so I guess um, I need to explain that. Um, you know, I, I have my PhD from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, and my master's also, and focused on the regulation of the medical use of psychedelics. But I learned a lot of political strategies. And when you're dealing with something that's demonized as much as LSD and other psychedelics are, when we try to bring it back from the underground, from the suppression, we have to pick therapeutic purposes that the mainstream people will be willing to accept. And so that's where death, people are more scared of dying than they are of drugs. So if we can show that psychedelics can help people who are anxious about dying to be less anxious and to appreciate more of their lives while they still have them, that's one way, a doorway into the culture. You know, the other is um, people who are traumatized, that we have great respect in our culture for soldiers, for veterans, for people who have sacrificed for their country and now are suffering. And so MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans or women who've been sexually abused as a child or raped as an adult or even people, any of us who are caught in a natural disaster, that we have to treat, we have to get beyond the us and the them. And so this is sort of the them. So and everybody's going to be dying. And so we're all worried about that to some extent. We all could be traumatized. And so those were the, the key clinical indications that we've decided to use to bring psychedelics back into the mainstream. Cool. Yeah. I, uh, I, I love the way you put that and it, it's so much better than the cool facts of the day that, that I was, <laughs> I was thinking about here. So, so thank you for that. I, in our last episode, when, when you were talking about training a full blooded wolf, yeah. uh, you talked about little red riding hood and my cool fact of the day was, was going to be that one interpretation of the red hood in little red riding hood is actually a reference to psychedelic mushrooms. Hmm. And when you look back at a lot of these fables, there are obvious clues to, to the fact that psychedelics were a part of basically these attempts to tell a story of what's happening inside your subconscious mind, uh, which uh, I was kind of blown away by when I read that. I'm like, well, it does make sense. Why, yeah. why did you have this bizarre, odd experience in the middle of the forest that clearly isn't real? Well, maybe it's because she was talking about an inner experience versus an outer one. Yeah. But yours rocked. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. you know, I, I think people don't really understand that our culture is a historical aberration and that the whole idea of prohibition is is not something that's been widespread throughout human history. I mean, it's, it's about power and domination, but that most cultures of the world have found a way to integrate psychedelics and the non-ordinary states of consciousness and the irrational into their understanding, their religion, their healing methods, and that we're sort of struggling against this um, unusual situation that I think in some ways, by separating the rational from the irrational, it's produced an enormous explosion in knowledge and in the, the mind, the, this massive development of our intellect and all of the technology that we've been able to do that and sort of has kept out of um, religion. We, we've had that with Galileo and Copernicus, where the scientists and religion started clashing, and so then they were kind of separated. But now we really need to bring them together, and th I think that's one of the really exciting things. There, there's actually an experiment that's being done in Switzerland with lifetime meditators who are given high-tech brain scans before and after a meditation retreat, and during the meditation retreat they're given psilocybin mushrooms. And they're looking at how that might deepen their spiritual experiences, deepen their meditation, produce 
um, altruism and um, positive pro-social things does this sense of connection what are the political implications but it's it's a way where science and religion are coming together now in a way that they haven't for four or five hundred years and I think that that's going to end up with the psychedelics um, being welcomed back into our culture I I certainly hope so. And, and it's funny that you brought that out because one of the first things I wanted to ask you about in this episode where we go through each each right. of the substances was about psilocybin or so-called yeah. magic mushrooms. And we've always kind of thought that most of the hallucinogens or psychedelics are, uh, are stimulants, but it maybe isn't quite that simple. What else did we learn from looking at brain scans of people who uh, are using these medications or yeah. these medicines? Yeah. Well, there, there's a woman named uh, Amanda Fielding who in England has started what's called the Beckley Foundation. And her interest has been in understanding what happens with psychedelics and blood flow in the brain. And, and her view was, uh, that for the last 40, 50 years of her life, that psychedelics stimulate the brain and that they will cause more blood flow in the brain and that will be somehow related to more awareness. And one of the things that I respect tremendously about Amanda is that she sponsored a study using an fMRI with psilocybin, functional magnetic resonance. And what she discovered, what, the, what was discovered directly re contradicted the theories that she'd been working with for the last 40 or 50 years. But she was able to wrestle with it and accept that that's what happened. So what she found, this is Robin Carhart Harris of Imperial College, uh, David Nutt was involved with these studies, and what they discovered is that psilocybin actually reduces blood flow in certain parts of the brain. And these are the parts of the brain that are known as the default mode network. So mm -hmm. what, what that means is the default mode network is sort of your resting state, your, your sort of basic state. And it's been identified in some ways with the ego, with who we think we are wa watching and, and looking for survival-based things. It's our sort of default that we refer back to is this sort of ego awareness. And what psilocybin does is it reduces the activity in this default mode network. And so what the default mode network is doing is there, there are so many perceptions that our senses are bringing in all the time through hearing, through sight, through smell, all, all sorts of stuff that's happening that we can cannot pay attention to all of it. So we kind of narrow our focus and we pay attention to those things that relate to our, our self, our survival, our enhancement, our pleasures. We kind of have this narrowing of consciousness to what's relevant to our individual ego and self. And what psilocybin does by weakening the blood flow to these default mode networks is it permits a flood of sensations to come to awareness. And so that's why a lot of times people feel that time is um, speeding up, that there's so much happening in a, in a moment, because there is always that much happening in a moment, but we're only focusing on a portion of it. So in, instead of psychedelics contributing to more blood flow in the brain, they contribute to the weakening of the part that filters, and we get this sort of unfiltered flood of material that helps us realize how much is going on, helps us feel the connections between everything, and it's um, it's it's a tremendous insight, and it's completely uh, contradictory. So that's where I think this idea of science and religion and therapy coming together is what's going to be really the tool to massive healing and also to introduction of new approaches in our society for spiritual experiences and a new understanding of what is this spiritual mystical experience. Well, that, that's uh, very well said. And uh, I've been studying the default mode and, and the active mode in the brain and even working on some new technology to allow you to be more aware of what's happening in the default mode because oh. creativity and intuition and all this, the, the unseen stuff is in there. And if you can fish stuff out of there, oftentimes that's the name for your new product. That's that, that intuition. That's, you know, figuring out the structure of the helical structure of DNA came from yeah. a dream. Yeah. And, and making that bridge more accessible is, is pretty interesting. And if, it turns out a substance can be used as a tool 
to help you have more or less default or active mode. And those brain states produce better performance, healing experiences, whatever they are. It seems like those are technologies that we ought to know about, given that we own these this hardware in our heads and we could do something with it. So. Yeah. Well, I think it was actually the benzene ring that came from a dream. And ah, the, the, the helical structure of DNA came from Francis Crick. And in the 50s, now this is... Um, I love he, it. You're totally right, by the way. So yeah, keep going. Okay. Yeah. So um, in 1953... Uh, Francis Crick, now he never said this when he was alive, but after he was dead, a friend of his said this, was that they were using LSD in low doses for <laughs> creativity. And in fact, there's a lot of people doing that now today. And, oh yeah, I know a few. Yeah, so what, what he claimed is that on one of these LSD days, he had the, Francis Crick had this idea of the helical structure of DNA. And we know that polymerase chain reaction which is how we replicate DNA now. It's the key to DNA analysis. Kerry Mullis was the fellow that developed that, and he won a Nobel Prize for chemistry for that. And he says that he was influenced by marijuana and LSD in coming up with it, and that wow. it was part of his creativity. And in fact, he, um, I reached out to him shortly after he got his Nobel Prize, and we had a, a communication, and he sent me this quote that was absolutely fantastic that we've used a lot in the MAPS bulletins. And what he said was, um, I think I would be stupid in some respects if it weren't for my psychedelic experiences. <laughs> so we, we have this kind of unusual connection between psychedelics and DNA and the understanding of how we operate. And, and I think there's, there's this intuition that, um, many people have that, that is somehow or other that we have this incredible technological development. We don't have the emotional, spiritual development and that psychedelics can play a role in bringing things into balance. And Albert Hoffman, who invented LSD, um, had that sense that, that there was a similarity in time between the uh, first chain reaction and the development of LSD, the discovery of LSD. And in fact, um, wow. some of the, the major um, dealers and chemists, uh, particularly Nicholas Sand, who uh, developed Orange Sunshine and has created a quarter of a billion doses of LSD in his career, wow. his father worked on the Manhattan Project. So and, did my grandfather and grandmother, by the way. Really? Really? <laughs> yeah, they actually met on the Manhattan Project in Chicago before they moved out to Los Alamos. Wow. Yeah, she, she was a nuclear, she is a, a nuclear engineer, and, and he's a PhD chemist. But yeah, well, the Manhattan Project had all sorts of strange stuff going on, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. Well, what, what do they say to you about this, uh, the irrational parts? When you talk about, you know, making friends, what, what did you get from them? I'm super curious. Um, you know... Engineers are engineers, and, and the, the, the prototypical engineer it is driven by the logic part of the brain. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, if I talk to my grandmother now, it, it is very much uh, almost Asperger like. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like, no, this is, you know, it, it's the way it is, and, it, and it's cut and dried. And, and I, I find that I'm sometimes two things. Like, I can see it from this perspective, but like, my, my body feels this way, but my mind says this. Uh, but it's not stressful because I recognize that they're just different phenomena. I don't think that my grandparents experienced the world that way uh, because they really worked hard to line up um, the rational brain as being in charge and to sort of force the emotional stuff to fit, even if it didn't always fit. Okay. Uh, you know, right. I have great respect for them. But. All right. So when I was, you know, 10 years old and we have this, you know, around the Cuban Missile Crisis and the, the whole nuclear arms race, what did your grandparents, you know, think about that? I mean, did they feel like the world can handle this technology uh, or, you know? You know, one of the, the and I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing for my grandmother, but um, one of the, the great sort of frustrations that, that I remember as, as a child, probably sometime in the 80s, was that she was asked to testify before some congressional panel about the use of uh, either pebble bed or breeder reactor, some kind of reactor that would eat up spent uh, nuclear fuel and mm -hmm. recycle it and could create earthquake safe uh, reactors. Wow. And she was like, like the science has changed so much since 30 years ago. If we would just make safe ones, like we could power everything and there wouldn't be any waste. And 
when she went there to, to talk about this, basically what Congress or the panel or Senate, I don't ask me yeah, which yeah, government body, yeah. what they told her was, well, you have a vested interest because you come from the industry, so we don't believe anything you're going to say. And she's like, I'm a scientist. Like, who else are you going to ask about this? Wow. Like, there is no, and, and she was really frustrated by that because she saw this huge opportunity, not yeah. for blowing stuff up, but an opportunity for actually, you know, pumping water to deserts, an opportunity for fixing climate change and reducing yeah. fossil fuels. And, and she's always been working for, you know, a better world from those right. fronts and, and devotes huge amounts of her time and energy to that. Even now, uh, to a smaller extent, she's, she's getting quite old, but, you know, she, she still has that, that desire to help. Wow. And, it, it's it's very interesting though to look at you know the creation of this which was also to help you know, win a war etc. Yeah, yeah. On, onto energy, so it, it, it's it's a fascinating question. Yeah, because that, that's where I, I was inspired by Albert Einstein. That's what we started the first hour with uh, was this idea of um, the technology that we have threatens the world and we need a new mode of thinking. And I think that is this wrestling with the irrational and somehow or other taming the wild the beast that causes us to fear and hate the other, the people that are yeah. different than us. And, and how do we do that? And, and I think for me, um, you know, we talked about how breath work is really helpful. So I think non-ordinary states of consciousness, psychedelics, breath work, meditation, any number of different ways, I think are really what's going to be needed to balance the um, sort of logical parts of our, our species. Yeah, there, there's definitely um, a, a big difference emotionally between killing something in anger or fear and killing something with intent but consciousness. And, and when you talk with, you know, a, a very elite, you know, Navy SEAL special operations kind of guy, it, it's a different vibe than, you know, the, the sort of angry soldier yeah, kind of right. movie perspective that, that's, that's portrayed there. You know, you, you, you can do it in anger or if, if you're at that state, you know, you're, you're doing it without the huge emotional stress that happens there. And, and it's, it, this is all very hard to express in words because a lot of this yeah. is internal feelings. And what I'm feeling is you're not feeling at the same time. So we can't both say that's the color blue. And, and that's right. why half of spiritual literature makes no sense whatsoever. Cause <laughs> <laughs> it's someone trying to explain something they felt that you don't have words for, but yeah. um, there is, there is something to be said around uh, our capacity for violence and those inner parts of our subconscious that are there around making sure the species survives even if that means eating and killing everything around you to do it. But if you let that be in charge instead of letting you be in charge, right. you're not going to like what happens. And what's in my own life I found is that understanding that that part of me, when it's in charge, I'm probably not going to know it unless I'm mm. constantly vigilant and well-trained. That's really important. And that allows me to be in situations where normally I'd be like, you know what, like, you know, let's throw down and like, all right, no, like I, I'm going to adjust things mm. because I can tell this is not what I'm choosing to have happen. This is something's happening in my body. And, and you can, you can learn that, but without something to make you pay attention, whether it's holotropic breathing, whether it's neurofeedback, which has been yeah. a huge improvement for me. Neurofeedback's oh, been great. the most impactful tech um, without something to teach you that stuff even just heart rate variability training yeah, yeah. you're probably going to do things you regret and then you're going to feel guilty about it and then <laughs> like you spend a whole yeah. huge amount of time and energy doing all that stuff instead of doing something useful or at least fun yeah and i think people are also um we're all kind of into patterns and we've got when it comes to adjusting our patterns to accommodate new information that's often really difficult and i think that's where this openness to the new and openness to change that you kind of is the hallmark of successfully taking a psychedelic is you have to surrender or even doing the breath work that you're voyaging into the unknown and you really have to let go of the known and open to uh, whatever is going to emerge and if you can do that the discoveries can be remarkable well, let's talk a little bit more. Uh, we mentioned psilocybin already. Psilocybin and smoking addiction, does it work? Well, I, I, I would first off say that it's the research that's been done with psilocybin and smoking addiction is, um, again, let's not focus too much on the drugs. It's psilocybin plus a cognitive behavioral approach towards reducing uh, nicotine addiction. And when you combine those approaches, they have remarkable success. And 
it, it's just really remarkable how effective they are. So it's it's, but it's not just here. You're a, a nicotine addict. Here, take psilocybin, and then you're not gonna be. You don't get a mushroom patch, and then you're done with smoking. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um, well, actually, a, um, my my wife's uh, one of her closest girlfriends um, married a fellow that worked for um, Pfizer, and he developed Chantix, which is the um, anti-smoking drug. And it works pretty well um, to help people um, get over those cravings. But even then, it doesn't work as well as this combination of psilocybin and, and uh, the cognitive behavioral therapy. But again, um, that's more labor-intensive. That's people that are self-selected. They, they're open to the psilocybin experience. Um, and so I, th I think that there's remarkable potential for psilocybin, for LSD, for mescaline and peyote, for ayahuasca in the treatment of addiction. And where I indicated that we're primarily focused on uh, end-of-life anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder, addicts tend to be the other. And we demonize it. And so that's where that's coming along really well. I think it's very important, the work that's being done with psychedelics in the treatment of addiction. And because it, it sort of helps people, again, see that it's not the drug. These psychedelics are considered drugs of abuse. It's how do you cure drug abuse with a drug of abuse? It's how it's used. And so I think that's very, very important work. And there was work in uh, the 50s and 60s with LSD for alcoholism. And in fact, Bill W., who started AA, um, had his first experience with belladonna that got him to stop alcohol. So he had a kind of psychedelic experience, somewhat disturbed, but that sort of woke him up. And then later, once he was sober, in the 50s, he tried LSD. And he felt that LSD would have a tremendous potential for the treatment of alcoholism. And he even tried to introduce it into AA. But it was, wow. it was and, and in fact, there's a book, the Bible of AA, called Pass It On. It's by uh, Bill W., about his life. And there's even some chapters about his experiences with LSD. And I met the people that gave him LSD and heard about his experiences and, and read his own writings about it. And so what, what, what we have with addiction in most cases is that people are running away from stuff and they're denying what's going on so they're they're not looking at what's going on and they also feel isolated and alone a lot this is more so for uh, heroin cocaine other things than the nicotine but that there's this sort of two phase aspect to the healing potential of psychedelics for addiction in that that same sense where the default mode network, where it's weakened, things that you're not wanting to look at come to the surface. And in a supportive environment with holotropic breathwork or psychedelics or biofeedback or the flotation tank, if you, you sit with it, people, you can see and wrestle with the things that you've been not trying to see. But the other part of it is that psychedelics can give you a sense of connection to yourself and to the world around you. So it's an antidote to the isolation and loneliness that a lot of times drives people to drug addiction. And William, uh, well, um, Carl Jung was actually approached by Bill W. Um, and talked about what to do for alcoholism. And he said the cure for dipsomania, which was alcoholism, is religiomania. <laughs> <laughs> so that, and a lot of times you see AA is a little bit like a religion, uh, in in many respects. But we look at the Native American Church. They are five hundred thousand people in the United States that went to the Supreme Court, have uh, won a major victory that says that they can legally practice their religion in the United States. And one of the main uses of peyote with the Native Americans is in the treatment of alcoholism and other drug addictions. And we also see that in uh, South America with ayahuasca, that a lot of times ayahuasca is used for helping people deal with addictions. There's a center in Peru called Takawasi, which is focused specifically on helping people with addictions. So I think the psilocybin nicotine addiction study that was done by Matt Johnson and others at Johns Hopkins with remarkable results, there's now being work with psilocybin in the treatment of alcoholism. And we're trying to get back to the leads that came from the research in the 50s and 60s. And these drugs, I mean, to give you a sense of, um, that there's, 
there's something different for each drug. Like psilocybin is a little bit different than uh, LSD, a little bit different than mescaline, a little bit different than ayahuasca. Um, but they all have a lot more in common than they have difference. Um, well, let's let's talk about say ecstasy or molly or MDMA. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know there's a connection with anxiety. That's yeah. even with autism, yeah. uh, PTSD, yeah. and vets. Walk a little bit through about like what what the okay. therapeutic uses yeah. of MDMA might be. This is in in combination with therapy, not just as a daily yeah. you know, daily thing you take. So what what yeah. what well, should we be researching that we're probably not researching enough? Well. Um, you mentioned autism. So we have a study at Harbor UCLA, which is for autistic adults with social anxiety and what and with MDMA. And we have a, th this was not a, um, a study that we came up with the idea on our own. It turns out that there's a lot of young people who are on the uh, autism spectrum, on the uh, Asperger's, who've gone to raves and parties, taken MDMA, ecstasy, molly, whatever, and said, Wow, now they can understand body language more, and they can understand their own emotions, and they can understand other people's emotions, and it had a lasting effect. And a woman, Alicia Danforth, did a PhD dissertation, gathering together all these stories, contacting as many as the people she could, and their families and doctors, and verifying that, that these stories were really true, and we used that as the basis for trying to get permission, which we did for a study with autistic adults with social anxiety. And we're focusing on the social anxiety, helping them to operate more in a social context. We've got a study that we're about to start in San Anselmo, California, with uh, people with life-threatening illnesses with MDMA. And we're primarily doing research all over the world, in Israel, Switzerland, Canada, you know, in Vancouver. Uh, we're doing a study um, in Boulder and Charleston and um, with MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. So basically, though, what MDMA does is different than the classic psychedelics. So MDMA, first off, it does work on serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, but in different ways. And what it does do is reduces activity in the amygdala, the fear processing part of the brain, and increases activity in the frontal cortex, which is where people put things in context. And at the same time, it stimulates oxytocin and prolactin, hormones of bonding, love, nurturing, uh, nursing mothers um, have a lot more uh, oxytocin. And what it also does is that it helps... Um, to think about MDMA, it's basically halfway between, chemically, between mescaline from peyote and methamphetamine. So methamphetamine is a stimulant, and it keeps you awake, uh, but it doesn't make you jittery. Mescaline is a psychedelic which affects your perceptions, it affects your, um, uh, your logical train of thought, but MDMA doesn't really uh, do that in the same way. So that it has the psychedelic properties of mescaline without a lot of the perceptual changes where people feel like they're still in control. And it has the stimulant property of methamphetamine without being jittery. And I should say that, that Sasha Shulgin, a uh, chemist and others have, have developed hundreds and hundreds yeah. of molecules trying to find all these different properties. And MDMA is the one he felt was the most therapeutic. So what it does by um, it's almost perfectly designed for the treatment of trauma or for the reduction of anxiety in any number of different ways. What about the damage to the serotonin receptors? Like That's a drug that I've, I've considered, given that I've dealt with the trauma that everyone has, but I've dealt with my own in, in lots of other modalities. Um, I, I'm concerned about yeah. serotonin sensitivity and all. Is there some risk with using MDMA? Um, well, all drugs have risks, and I think it would be, um, you know, inappropriate and wrong for me to say that MDMA has no risks. But I would also say that the risks of MDMA neurotoxicity have been vastly exaggerated. Okay. And that right now, if you go into Medline or PubMed, which is the repository of the world scientific literature in medicine since about 1965, and if you put in MDMA or ecstasy, there's over 4,900 papers 
produced at a cost of roughly $350 million, we guess. And these are mostly funded by uh, governments of the world looking at the risks of MDMA. And a lot of it was on the same question about neurotoxicity. So we have an enormous body of information. And just to go back a little bit, when I started MAPS in 1986, um, there was very early research that was done by a Dr. George Riccardi at University of Chicago with MDA in rats, and he felt that there was some evidence that it would reduce um, serotonin. And so that was on the basis of that, the DEA emergency scheduled MDMA. And so then I worked with George Riccardi as a major, as my major relationship professionally, and we switched to, um, I bought him the first monkeys to try to use species that were closer to us. Um, and then we did a study that was called the no, looking for the no effect level, a no L, no effect level. So what we did was, um, MDMA was given um, five milligram, two and a half milligrams a kilogram every um, two weeks for eight weeks. So, um, I mean, every two weeks for four months, eight times. All right. So, at two and a half milligrams a kilogram, there was no effect on serotonin. So, once the doses get higher and higher, then there is an effect on the serotonin system. But the key thing is, what are the functional consequences? So we don't know. Brains are changing all the time. So in our therapy study, where people have get MDMA three times in a three and a half month process, we've done neurocognitive tests before and after and showed no change from MDMA. So there's no evidence in a therapeutic context of pure MDMA taken in roughly um, 125 milligrams plus two hours later uh, half of that, 62 and a half, so roughly 187 milligrams, that taken during the day when people are not overheating, they're not exercising, they're lying down, they're in those yeah. contexts, then there's no evidence whatsoever that there is any neurotoxicity. Now, we since have done studies in monkeys, studies in humans, and there's an enormous body of evidence that is... Um, pretty clear that at the therapeutic doses that we're talking about, the risks are minimal compared to the potential benefits. And so every single drug that, you, you know, if you, you see all these ads on TV for pharmaceutical drugs and you have this long list at the end yeah. of, you know, what are all the risks? So I, I think that the one, the best evidence for MDMA neurotoxicity is the fact that for many people, they report that over time, MDMA loses its magic, loses its sparkle, that there's something that is changed. And, and I would say for marijuana, that if you, if you don't smoke it every day, if you smoke marijuana once a week, you can smoke marijuana for their whole life. And every time you smoke it, you're going to get high in a similar way. So there is no sort of loss of magic or loss with marijuana. And the same would be true. We don't know that that really um, happens for other drugs like LSD. But with MDMA, there is this um, sort of loss of magic. And it happens to different people at different times. For me, it happened after like 50 or 60 times. And I still find that it's useful. It's just not as profound and as deep and as peaceful as it was initially. So that is, I think, the best evidence that there is some sort of brain change that makes it so people, but it doesn't mean that I'm less happy. It doesn't mean people are more depressed, less happy, anything. It just has that highly specific thing. And it's actually a safe, a safety factor because the drugs that people get addicted to are those drugs that once you develop a tolerance to, then you just take higher and higher amounts to get to the same effect. But with MDMA, if you develop this sort of loss of magic, you don't get the feelings back by taking higher and higher amounts. You get more of the stimulant, methamphetamine-like properties. So there's a built-in safeguard. So we know that there's loads of people that could be addicted to heroin, addicted to cocaine for decades. There are people that overuse MDMA, but usually that's short-lived, six months, a year. 
then their uh, affect flattens and they give it up and then after six months or a year they're sort of back to normal. So I think that there is a risk of MDMA, but that in therapeutic contexts and even in most recreational contexts, now the, there, there really is no risk. And now what happened with George Riccardi is that this understanding was developing, that, the, that even though NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, was trying to say that one dose of MDMA caused permanent uh, neurotoxicity with major functional consequences. You should never do it, even in research. It was too dangerous. That view was being eroded in all different ways by scientists all over the world. And okay. so George then did this study at Johns Hopkins with monkeys, and he claimed that somehow or other now he discovered that it really affected the dopamine system. And he published a paper, a famous paper in Science, the preeminent journal in the world in science, that said that MDMA one single dose of MDMA could potentially cause Parkinson's-like symptoms. That you take MDMA, you're going to reduce dopamine, and it could cause Parkinson's. The editor of Science, Dr. Alan Leshner, published an editorial about this article saying how important it was, and that MDMA is like Russian roulette. And there was something about this research that didn't seem right, and that was that there was a high number of animals that died in their study. And we'd previously, as I said, I funded research with uh, MDMA and monkeys. I even have gotten spinal taps twice myself with George Riccardi, and I've gotten bunches of, of my friends to get spinal taps because before brain scans came in, to, the best way to do uh, understand about neurotransmitters was to take spinal fluid and look at neurotransmitter metabolites in the spinal fluid. So God, we, that's horribly painful. To I've had that done, and man, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, you have to be dedicated to science to get a spinal tap. Yeah. Put it that way. Well, I felt that there was a uh, war on drugs, and I was fighting on the part of drugs, <laughs> really, on the part of MDMA. And I could afford, you know, if, if people can go to war for what they believe in, I could get a spinal tap. And yeah, that's so, a fair point. So um, I did, and it was to say, I don't feel damaged. Prove it. But what happened with this study about Parkinson's is that we challenged it. We wrote a letter to the editor of Science and said, the doses that you're using aren't equivalent to human doses. The route of administration isn't equivalent. The animals are dying. Something about this doesn't make sense. But they were losing faith that they could stop research by talking about serotonin damage. And so now this was dopamine. And then what happened about a year and a half later is that they retracted the study. It was a tremendous uh -huh. scandal because it turned out that they had switched the bottles and they were giving animals methamphetamine instead of MDMA. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the biggest scandals in science, you know, over the last multiple decades. The, Human error right there. Something happened and they were so zealous to find problems with MDMA that they overlooked the fact that none of the previous research showed problems with dopamine. Our, serotonin, our spinal tap study showed no effect on dopamine. And so they ended up actually, they were quiet for like a year and a half because they kept trying to replicate the studies and they couldn't find dopaminergic neurotoxicity. And they kept trying to say, okay, we're going to give higher doses of MDMA. We're going to give higher doses. Uh, we're going to uh, increase the temperature of the animals because temperature is a cofactor yeah. for neurotoxicity. We're going to crowd them together. We're going to do all sorts of things. And they couldn't find it. And then they figured out, okay, maybe something went wrong. And that's when they did an autopsy of one of the animals and said, oh, my God, they had methamphetamine, not MDMA. Awesome. So they they withdraw. They had to retract that. So that was in around 2004. That was the high watermark of the paranoia about the neurotoxicity of MDMA. And All right. That's. I, I think listeners will be uh, will, will be served by by learning that uh, that stuff. And there's things in there that I absolutely haven't known about. I, yeah. I'm relatively careful with my brain, despite what people who know of my biohacking yeah. experiments with the electricity think. And <laughs> all right, that. That, that, that's really that's really helpful. Now we have a few more minutes, and okay. there's three different substances I want to ask you about. Okay. Um, so we'll, we won't dive as deep on those as we have. Um, one of them is um, um, cannabis. Ah. So let's talk about some of the potential medical or okay. therapeutic uses of cannabis, but we've got to go quick on this uh, one. Okay. Well, MAPS I started in 1986, and so it's roughly uh, 28 and a half years. We've never had a government grant. It's all been donations by individuals and family foundations. We just recently received our first government grant from the state of Colorado, $2.1 mil <laughs> yeah, $2 million to study marijuana 
for post-traumatic stress disorder in U.S. veterans with chronic treatment-resistant PTSD. So MDMA, we've talked about, we believe that MDMA helps people to, um, in a sense, a cure. I'm reluctant to use the word cure, but oftentimes it can cure PTSD and have a durable remission of symptoms. Marijuana for PTSD um, helps people sleep through the night. They don't have the nightmares. It focuses them more on the present. So the we have a system, the endocannabinoid system, that responds to the cannabinoids, to THC and CBD and others, in a whole incredible variety of ways. Uh, medical marijuana has an enormous number of applications. PTSD is just one of them. Pain, um, epilepsy, we've seen this on Sanjay Gupta. Um, he's actually working on Weeds 3, so the first two, and Weeds 3 is going to talk about our M marijuana PTSD study in veterans, because there's roughly 8,000 veterans every year that commit suicide, and a fair number of them are from post-traumatic stress disorder, and marijuana can help, and yet we've had enormous problems getting this study started, and there's a government monopoly on the legal supply of marijuana that you can use in research. And it's um, held by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. They don't want to give it to you if you want to find out what's good with marijuana. And we have to end that monopoly. So that's one of the things we're doing. But marijuana is good for nausea control, for cancer chemotherapy, for appetite stimulation. I mean, everybody talks about the munchies. Well, during the AIDS epidemic, when people were dying of AIDS wasting, they would use marijuana for appetite. For cancer chemotherapy, people lose their appetite. So there's just an enormous amount. And most importantly, and then we'll go on to the other things, is that we're now discovering that the cannabinoids have anti-tumor properties. So yeah. ma marijuana does not cause lung cancer. You talked about your lungs. It's something that um, tobacco clearly causes lung cancer. Marijuana does not cause lung cancer. And there's epidemiological studies that show it. There's been um, NIDA-funded research, Dr. Donald Tashkin at uh, UCLA, the world's expert. You know, marijuana can cause more colds, more infections, certain things in your lungs, particularly for heavy smokers. But there's anti-tumor properties that protect from lung cancer. Marijuana you know, is it's just incredible what the cannabinoids can do. Yeah, I would add, though, that if you're... If your cannabis is moldy, it probably can cause lung cancer. No, well, no, it can cause <laughs> it's other things. Be the good stuff. <laughs> well, no, no, I don't think so. It, because if we would, a lot of, we would see that. But, yeah. but mold causes other kinds of infections, but not cancer. Oh, okay. Well, we, we can well, have a much, well, a much longer okay, conversation. Okay. Well, well, a, a PubMed driven conversation about that one, but uh, we're not okay. going to do that now. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I'd be interested in that, but, but I, yeah. I, um, I believe that um, there's no epidemiological evidence or scientific evidence of marijuana, but but certainly avoid moldy I, marijuana. Th there you go. I, I, I hear you there. Um, I'm, I'm thinking more about aflatoxin being the most cancer-causing chemical we know of, which is oh, that, direct mold toxin. Okay, okay. And if you have that kind of stuff in there, which tobacco unfortunately does sometimes, right. it does increase carcinogenic carcinogenicity. Okay. However, if the anti uh, anti-cancer effects of yeah. basically what's in the marijuana when it's vaporized and inhaled. If they counteract that, I have no idea. I just know if yeah. you've got mold in there, it's it's okay. bad news. And the more okay. mold you have, the more likely your cancer is. So, like, anyway, you shouldn't smoke moldy pot anyway. It's bad. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, oh, well, let me just add one thing, which is yeah. that the um, the concentrations that you need of the cannabinoids to really kill tumors are greater than people normally get by smoking. So that I'm not trying to say smoke pot, you're not going to get cancer. What I can say is that, that certain kinds of brain cancers, other cancers, you need more direct um, administration. Is uh, that... Like C CBD oil? Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Uh, if you're listening in your car, I just held up a little <laughs> thing of CBD oil, which is uh, basically the, the bioactive components of marijuana. This this one is actually without at least reasonable amounts of THC. So it, it, you don't feel it, but it has those those yeah. anti tumor properties. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, it it's awesome, especially on, on that front, just to see that there is real science being done. Yeah. It's not about these are good or these are bad. It's just that these are tools. Exactly. And, and as a biohacker, every tool on the planet is my right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And like to say, oh, don't use those tools. We don't like those. Like, sorry, like like we're not in in high school with clicks anymore. And yeah, the, the function of the internet and the cloud and all has, has been to let us have this conversation to be able to let everyone else who uses these things share the science. And at the end of the day. 
I, I, I wouldn't recommend or not recommend you use these. I would say if you are going to use any of these, you, uh, you better do it with consciousness and with some people to help you out or you probably aren't going to like what happens. Yeah, well, on this theory of, on this theme of rights, uh, one of our biggest donors is the Libra Foundation. It's the Nick and Susan Pritzker family. And their foundation is focused on human rights. And they had a multi-year discussion about whether uh, psychedelic research um, is part of human rights. And they decided that it was. Yeah, amen. Yeah, that, that it's the right to explore our consciousness. Uh, the, the line between the right to eat what you want and the right to use the psychedelics you want is very blurry because different foods affect how you feel. And yeah. it's just a question of strength. So if, if you can make the argument that you shouldn't be able to take this, you can also make the argument that you shouldn't be able to eat whatever nutrition makes you feel best. And I, yeah. I think it's a very slippery slope and uh, the whole set of regulations there are, um, are anti-freedom. Yeah. Now there's two more drugs that I want to ask you about in, in kind of okay. to almost snippet levels. So we fit okay. into the window we've got for the podcast. Um, uh, one of them is, is DMT or ayahuasca. Ah, great. Um, one I've, I've used in, in a ceremony in, in South America. So what are some of the things that are interesting about it and why might we want to study it or potentially use it? Well, um, DMT, um, is orally inactive, but people smoke DMT. And it's incredible disorientation of your ego, and people report spiritual experiences. When it's mixed with a certain kind of plants in ayahuasca form with MAOIs, that you, you, it doesn't get metabolized in the stomach, and so it lasts longer. It's about, uh, you know, several hours or so, and it has a more uh, therapeutic potential. We're also, uh, MAPS is trying to develop an expertise in PTSD. There are a yeah. fair number of veterans who have, and others who've gone down to, um, Peru and Brazil for ayahuasca for PTSD. So we're now starting a study, an observational study of veterans who are going to go down to, um, Peru, Mexico, and experience ayahuasca. Now, ayahuasca doesn't have as much of the fear reduction properties of MDMA. But it, it can be scary as all hell to be perfectly technical about it. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, it's not so clear because you need the surrounding support. And yeah. then also when you're vulnerable in a foreign culture, in a foreign context, often with foreign religions, it's, it's difficult to really feel safe enough to explore. And so, you know, again, what we're thinking though is that for some people, the, um, the ayahuasca can can have a healing properties. There's also work that's being done with ayahuasca in the treatment of depression. But there's there's sort of a tension here in that there are some groups that focus on the religious use of ayahuasca, and whatever happens, healing comes from the the pursuit of the religious experience. Then there's others more scientific that are saying, okay, this is just a tool. We can take it out of this context, put it in a scientific context. And in fact, there's a group in um, in Barcelona that's using freeze-dried encapsulated ayahuasca. Oh, wow. Which is standardized. So it's a way that to do standardized research. They're doing brain scan stuff with it. They're doing a whole host of research with ayahuasca as a tool rather than as a religious sacrament. And so I think it has that same ability to bring things to the surface. It's a little bit more embodied. A lot of people vomit and feel like purging when they're on ayahuasca. There's a, a bodily energy, a, a, you know, they call it the power and the light. There's a, a lot of activity in the brain. Um, it's more condensed and shorter than an LSD or a psilocybin experience. Um, I think it has tremendous uh, therapeutic potential. And actually, a lot of our support is coming from um, fairly um, successful business people who've been spiritualized, you could say, by ayahuasca. And the Supreme Court of the United States has said uh, unanimously that the Unia de Vegetal, the UDV, um, mm -hmm. can practice their religious rights in the United States with ayahuasca. But you have to be part of the church, and that's kind of a problem, you know, because you have to believe certain things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the problem. It, it, yeah. It, it's, uh, it, it doesn't seem like the government should be in the business of telling us what we have to believe to access chemicals that affect our brains. But right, 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 right. Well, well, that's actually a, a really important point, which is that religious freedom, the problem is you need a religion. <laughs> you know, so we, we, we should say that we all have our individual f human right to explore spirituality the way we want, and we shouldn't have to be part of an organized religion to do it. Yeah. And, and that's where I think 
we're going to find that religious freedom is going to move forward as it is, but it and medical freedoms will move forward. And both of those together will eventually change people's minds as we also watch marijuana become legal and we see the disenchantment with prohibition and mass incarceration. Eventually we'll get to this point where we have the freedom to explore our consciousness even if we're not technically sick with a diagnosable illness. That, that's really where we're trying to end up. Um, that's, uh, that's remarkable. Uh, we're up against the end um, of the show. Okay. Let's see. The other thing is that at the end of, uh, of every episode, I ask uh, the same question I have for almost uh, a little bit more than 200 people now. <laughs> now, given all that you know, not just about what your, your work at Mass, but your life's experience, the three most important things you would share with someone who wants to perform better at whatever it is they're here to do. So if you want to kick more ass at life, three most important uh, learnings in your experience. Ah, well, the, the first is to um, not, not so much care about outcomes, but care about the effort. And I think that was particularly something for me that I had to really focus on because when I started trying to uh, work on my own psychedelic therapy and to bring psychedelic research back, it looked like that might never happen or it might be uh, you know, multi general and it is turning out to be a multi-generational thing. I'll only get the small portion, portion of the way in my life. So I think if you can redefine success as effort rather than outcomes, although you really need to focus on outcomes to try to figure out if your effort is wise and effective. But I'd say that, that's really the prescription for, for joy and for, um, not burning out. Um, the, the second I think would be to, um, I guess probably many people would say this, but it's really to sort through, to recognize that your life is actually very short and that you need to focus on what you're really passionate about, to think about what it is that um, you care about. And that's more important than money and more important, although, of course, we need money for survival. But I think finding, you know, those things that that internal motivation that will sustain you throughout, you know, in the many different forms that, that your work uh, takes. And then the other is just to, um, be able to sit with yourself when things are difficult. And instead of, like in the flotation tank or like with psychedelics, the, the main thing is that, um, letting feelings in rather than blocking them, that, um, opening up to what's happening. It's kind of a meditative thing. Um, but that you'll find that once you can sit with stuff, things will sort out and you'll, um, you'll be able to, um, to see through the mists and see through the, the, the flurry of, you know, emotional storms and just sit with that rather than, so open rather than suppress. I think that's the third thing. That's, uh, that's awesome advice. Uh, thank you for that. But, uh, I, um, I just had a, an idea here um, that was probably fueled by some sort of default mode network thing. <laughs> um, if, uh, if for people listening, if you enjoyed the show, I, uh, thanks for listening, number one. Number two, I, I think we've made a pretty convincing case that science ought to be looking at this whole sort of banned class of drugs as something that may be useful in certain circumstances for certain people and that demonizing them or putting them on an altar, neither one of those extremes is particularly uh, particularly useful or beneficial or even scientific. And, and that looking at them for what they are versus what we've painted them to be might be helpful. So so I'm, I'm a fan of what MAPS is doing and I'm going to come up with a little challenge. And I know that about oh, 50,000 people have listened to each of these episodes and it keeps growing every, every month. So maybe it's 60,000 people. Wow. So if you like this episode, uh, I'll do a little challenge. I'm really looking to help people see the Bulletproof Diet book, which is the, the work I just did that's just come out on the New York Times list. And I'm looking to show my publisher that my audience cares about this. So if over the course of, of this week, if we sell 2,500 copies of the Bulletproof Diet book, I will donate 
all of the profits that I receive from those, not the total cost of the sales, directly to MAPS. Wow. So this isn't about me making money, this is about me supporting something that's important, and this is about you getting a book that you can just give to someone you like. You could also just give the money straight to MAPS at maps.org, and I'm totally down with that, but if you wanted the book anyway, like, come on, check it out, Bulletproof Diet, you know how to order books. <laughs> uh, wow. And I will track the sales with my publishers, and I'm serious, every nickel that my publishers pay me for those, those sales will go uh, we'll go straight to maps. So uh, support the Bulletproof Diet book and support maps or just support maps. This is just good work and these are tools like neurofeedback, like all these other things, they're our birthright. And when people mess with that, whatever their name is, it's not cool and now, well, we can fix that. <laughs> Beautiful, Dave, thank you so much. You got it. So have an awesome evening. Thanks so much for staying up late there in Boston where it's yeah. dark and cold, <laughs> as opposed to here in Canada where it's also dark and cold. And <laughs> have, a, have a great day. Thanks wow. a lot for your work. Thank you so much, Dave. This has been a privilege and a pleasure to speak with you.